Wait, do we, <laughs> so I don't do it again. I'm not. St- you're gonna. You're not gonna say. Can you believe it? No. <laughs> okay. not then, then what are you wanting me to? Say? Where am I supposed to jump in? Just, just commenting jump in wherever you want. Okay. Don't look at the script. All right. All Let's right. Just have a conversation. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So we're at over twenty thousand downloads of our first three episodes in one hundred and one countries. Can you believe it? I can <laughs> believe it because Scott called every person he knows and they've all been really generous in, in downloading and giving us a try. And then there's a lot of folks that are certainly we don't have 20,000 friends between us. But thank you so much to the people that are willing to give us a shot and liked it and keep coming back. And thanks for the initial download. And please subscribe. Yes. And, and I think we have a fair amount of subscribers. I actually can't track that, but it, you can sort of tell when our new episode hits how many we have that first day sort of right off the bat. And here's the thing. We're not stopping. We're only just getting started. We have a file cabinet with literally thousands of story ideas in it, and we're going to keep doing this as long as we can. So thank you for tuning in. Do you have anything to add to that? No. Uh, clicking while I'm talking? <laughs> you know, I was looking up how many nations are in the United Nations, and I think it's like 124. So we will not stop until we've got a download from each one of those. You know, it, most of the downloads are in the United States. There is a long list of... Oh, there's some there's some uh, far-out reaching countries there. Yeah, and there's a long list of them, some that we just have four or three or two or one. And you know what's interesting? There's one particular country that I want to talk about right now, and that is New Caledonia, which actually I can't even call a country. It is a special collectivity of France, whatever that means. Uh. New Caledonia is about 850 miles off the east coast of Australia. And it, normally I'd have – we have one download there, by the way. Yeah. Normally I would have no idea of finding out who that person was, and nor would I bother, whatever. You guys all have your listeners. Trust me, yeah. you all have your privacy. <laughs> you, you, know, you know where they connect to the internet, though. Yeah, you can yeah. look at the IP address. It gives you a clue, whatever. Right. But it's – you know, this is not a movie. I'm not, like, tasking satellites to find you in a coffee shop. But. Although we could. But you know these people. Yeah, I know these people. It's a couple that have been at sea since 2009 and are circumnavigating the globe in a 44-foot sailboat. Okay. Now, ha- uh, have they done it all once or is it taking them this long? No, it's taking them this okay. long. But I mean, they're doing it, they're they're doing it leisurely. Time. Yeah, right. they're not at sea full time and they avoid really bad weather and that sort of thing. But I used to work oh. for one of them. His name is Alex Froline. Alex was my boss in New York City for several years. And him and his wife, Iris, sold – Everything they had, including a bitchin' loft south of Canal Street in Manhattan, and she closed down her thriving interior design business, and they left. And they bought this 44-foot sailboat, and they spend all their time sailing. And I love – I'm on an email list with them. It's one of those dream vacations, you know. Yeah. yeah everybody – yeah. People it's insane. who go around the world. But and, and it's exciting, and a lot of people take trips and that sort of thing. But this is real blue water stuff here. These guys, the, the amount of training that uh, they both went through – to be qualified to do this and to do it safely is, is, is kind of astronomical. It's more than a, a week of nights at the learning annex. To, yeah, to, yeah, to, exactly. You, you don't just pick up a book. <laughs> well, know, hey, I used to be a day sailor. I used yeah. to charter sailboats. I could never oh, what's, afford to Scott, what's one. the difference between a day? Well, I imagine maybe the difference between being a visual pilot and an instrument rated pilot, well, day sailing and night no, sailing? Day, it's not a technical term. It just means, you know what, I got in a boat and I went from Marina Del Rey to Catalina Island, right. you know, which is 30 and miles and, and right. I stayed overnight and... But you can see land the whole time, that sort of thing. I, yeah, I did that stuff, and I enjoyed it. And I also have a tremendous amount of respect for what goes into it. And I can tell you that these two are couldn't be more qualified to pull this trip off. That said, you know, tonight's show is about Amelia Earhart. And I can't help but find comparisons between what these two are going through and, and what, hap- what she went through and what happened to her. Well, one, they're in the neighborhood. That's right. They are, they are about 1,000 miles south of all the areas we're going to be talking about tonight, which in the Pacific Ocean is like next door. When you look on Google Earth at their current positions or the places that they've been, it's all right in the area that we researched for tonight's show. It's incredibly vast. And, and then if you've ever been to Hawaii and looked that up on a map or taken the, the plane flight, you realize it's not just off the coast. It's, no. it's a good long ways away. It is a long ways away. And Well, they went even further. So they have a website. Their, their boat is called the Alaris, which is a combination of their names, Alex and Iris. They have a website, which they've given me permission to share. It's alaris.com. That's A-L-A-E-R-I-S dot com, which has got their whole trip on. It's really fascinating. Lots of pictures and log entries from their travels, where, which have been super fascinating. And I'm also on an email list where I receive 
updates from them with latitude and longitude. And, and it's great because I'll sit down with my five-year-old son and we'll look on Google Earth and I'll show him where they are and where they've been. And we'll talk about the different places. And the great thing about Google Earth is a lot of times users have posted pictures so you can vicariously go and see what it's like where they were. But I got an update from Alex the other night, which I get one probably every few weeks when they're actually underway. How do they connect to the internet? They have satellite service. On the boat? Yes. It's very sparse. Anytime you email them, you're instructed to keep it short and sweet and not do a reply. You'd and think no it'd be fa- it's direct to the satellite. You're bypassing uh, your, yeah, your cable neighbors. Yeah, but the expensive, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I think no. it's But that like, happens with, with folks who uh, I think sign up with HughesNet that are out in the boonies. Yeah. You got a dish. It should be... Uh, like your cable TV, your right. dish satellite, but it's not. It's, it's, it's not. Yeah. No, it's not. And, and they have to be careful about it because they're also accessing other information with it, weather and navigational information. They, they need it for a lot of other things. So uh, he sent me an email the other night, and there was something that struck me about it because after researching Amelia Earhart so intensively for the past couple of weeks and getting really inside of her head and probably what she went through to undertake her circumnavigation, which of course didn't work out, I recognized in an update from him how easily things can get out of control and more importantly how – You can't really plan for nature. So they sent this out right after they left New Caledonia, where they had uh, some family that they were visiting. And they stayed in Noumea, which is the biggest city there and the capital, I believe, where they downloaded our show. On our trip to New Caledonia, we had some problems with adverse currents that we got stuck in. At one point, we sailed 40 miles out of our way to get out of a two-knot countercurrent. After this experience, I decided to do some research while in Noumea on current prediction models. I found a good-looking one that allows you to look at any place in any ocean and get a graphic representation of the currents in the area. It's updated once a day. I spent the better part of yesterday trying to sail this current map with dubious results. It did identify major shifts in currents, but was not very accurate with respect to continuity. After a while, I decided that I was going to drive myself crazy trying to track every possible shift, so I forced myself to stop and just sail. I know where the big problems lie, but don't try to predetermine everything. It's another example of nature not quite conforming to our expectations of it. Yeah, it can uh, lead you astray. Quickly. Very quickly and with deadly results. A two-knot countercurrent doesn't sound like much. No, but things like that in nature, it it builds up. Things things pile up very quickly. Next thing you know, you're out of fuel, you're out of food, you're out of time, you're in a storm. It's 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 a billion things that can happen. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook. I'm Forrest Burgess, and this is Kristen Faircloth as Amelia Earhart. WLJ, Holland Port, Waters High. This is Amelia Earhart. SOS. Some of what are thought to be Earhart's last words as heard and written down by then 15 year old Betty Clink from St. Petersburg, Florida, whose dad had rigged a 60 foot antenna to the family shortwave radio. Tonight's show is part one of a two-part special in which we'll trace Amelia Earhart and her navigator Fred Noonan's final voyage into history. You know, after Greyfriars Kirkyard, our Halloween special, which turned out to be this unbelievably deep rabbit hole. And it wasn't research, supposed to be. Yeah, we, we, we knew it was going to be kind of complicated, but we thought, hey, you know, we, this piece of news just came out, right, about Amelia Earhart a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, very recently. We thought it would be fun to do a current event. When the story, there was a big story out about how they found this piece of metal on this island, Nika Mororo, which used to be Gardner Island in the South Pacific. You know, there's a general area where she's thought to – or known to have disappeared based on just the laws of physics. She's got to be there somewhere. But it's a Uh, wide-ranging, vast – Piece of sea. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so anyway, this thing came out about, oh, we have this piece of metal. It has these rivets on it. And we are convinced this is the patch that was made for Amelia Earhart's plane. And it was in the news. It blew up. The media picked it up. CNN, everybody – and we thought, hey, you know what's fun? We'll do a current event. Let's talk about how Amelia Earhart crashed on this island in Nicomororo. It sounds like these guys have got this thing sewn up, right? <laughs> Little did we know. No. It, it's yeah. like you start to do this research because we at this show feel compelled to take a really good look at what we're going to be sharing. We with don't you. want to relay bad information. Exactly. Yeah. Unlike, I can say honestly at this point, <laughs> CNN. Well, or a yeah. lot of news outlets who all ran with that story about we that don't piece have, of metal. Right. We because don't I'll to. tell you what. I don't think that piece of metal came from her plane, but let's not get into that yet. Okay. You know, th- th- this is the thing about this because – and you may not have heard about the piece of metal. Maybe as one of our listeners, as we made a uh, reference to earlier, you guys are all over the world. And funnily enough, Alex who, on the sailboat in the 
cold open when I had asked him if I could quote him and use his piece in our thing. And he goes, you know, you're the second person to email me about Amelia Earhart. What are the odds of that? And then <laughs> right after that, he wrote, is she in the news? <laughs> you know, yeah, he, he was, has no idea. He's he was, at sea. Okay, he wasn't he's not, being sarcastic. No, he's yeah. he's not following the right. news right now because he's, you know, he's yeah, just trying to stay alive. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> right. But... Uh, I think it's a fair and relevant question because they're in the neighborhood. Yeah, they are. They are. And 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 I guess what I want to say is like I, I had a little bit of a Heath Ledger experience with this. You know, his whole like everyone talks about how depressed he got while he was playing the Joker in Batman. And when I say that one little old mare will die, well, then everyone loses their minds. I can honestly say that, you know, I'm I'm not going to say I'm depressed or whatever. I'm not making light of depression either. But what I'm saying is that my head has been so far up in all of these possible outcomes for her. I honestly feel like I've lived them. And I I feel very bad in a very genuine, like deep, heartfelt way for the way that I think she probably died because none of these outcomes are good. I mean, only, only one of them is pseudo good and it's the weakest one it'll be right. you know, which is the whole she lived in new jersey <laughs> <laughs> well, that, and just didn't want to be bothered yeah uh but that's the thing with great adventure comes great risk that's true that's and true. uh she knew what she was getting into and that accounts to her bravery I that's think. true and that's the other thing i can also say i you know i don't know for you Forrest, but for me the more that i've dug around about her she was an unbelievably courageous person. Well, unbelievably. just very driven, very goal oriented. Had had big dreams since being a kid. Very adventurous. Yes, uh, since she was a kid, and that just translated into a career of doing a lot of different things, but always knowing that she wanted to fly. Right. You know what? We should talk a little bit about her background before we get into that ill fated trip. So. Right. What kind of a person was she? Here, let's start out with when she was born. She was born in 1897, in July of 1897, in Atchison, Kansas. She was kind of a tomboy growing up, and her mom was not interested in raising nice little girls because Amelia had a sister. <laughs> She let them do whatever they wanted to do. She didn't pigeonhole them. And at that time, that was crazy. That's the thing, you know, it's not so unusual now for people to say, oh, we're trying not to be gender biased. But, like, she really said, you guys do what you want. Explore. Be the people you want to be. And so Amelia was a very adventurous person. And she always was kind of a daredevil. She famously was like, you know, no, but you know what? Jumping I, things off ramps. Yeah, and, uh, you know. Well, into that story, I believe the very first time she took air, right. she crashed. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> going uh, going uh, for, from a ramp off the uh, the family shed that I think uh, an uncle or somebody had built. had built for her. Yeah, exactly. And then she went off in a kind of a makeshift cart. Or a sled, I guess, and and crashed and got a fat lip from it, but loved the thrill. Yeah, loved every minute. And told her little sister that it was just like flying. Yeah. Just somebody who is not afraid of the thrill of adventure and, I don't know, like like what we talked about last time, uh, getting on a roller coaster. That kind of excitement that comes with uh, cheating death, you know, exploring the boundaries. She was into adventurous things. And eventually her dad took her to an air show, paid this pilot, uh, Frank Hawks, on December 28th, 1920, $10 to take her on a plane ride. And her quote about this trip was, By the time I had got two or three hundred feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. That must have been amazing. I can't even imagine what that was like. Well, you know, I did, a, I did a similar thing when I was a kid. No. I was with my parents. We were driving, I think, through northern Idaho. And it's a area that's now more of an amusement park type of thing. Not very large. But they, at the time, I think they had a train that was on display, an old steam locomotive. Uh, There's a few, you know, a few things to crawl around on. And there was a guy, a pilot, who was giving rides on an old biplane, World War I era. Oh, wow. the so plane, it's like the Great Waldo Pepper. Have it you was, ever seen that movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. great. Robert Redford? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, it, yeah. Uh, I haven't seen it in a long time, but very similar idea. I just idea. happened to have seen it a few weeks ago. <laughs> in By relation to this? coincidence, no. Before we even wow, got Wow, there you go. That's what gave us the, uh, yeah. the, uh, the threat of that. Yeah. And any, I went up. I can't remember how much it was. It was probably like 15, 20 bucks, which, you know, was fairly significant for just a ride, a one-time ride. It probably lasted... Oh, maybe 20 minutes. (laughs) 
you know, 30 minutes, but I loved it. It was a great, I love the f- sensation of flying. When I get on a commercial flight now, I a lot of times will sit by the window just to look out the window and look at the ground going away and yeah. look at the clouds. And it's I can't. It's pretty amazing. You no, know, and Even most people, uh, you know, it's very routine now. People get on, they take a nap, they bring a full size pillow, which I don't understand. It's not a sleepover. <laughs> <laughs> I, we used to have to dress up. I wore slacks and a little jacket when I was a kid uh, when we got a flight. Cute. But that's what people did. It was, it, it was still a wondrous thing. But uh, what I was going to say to finish up my story. It's an old World War I biplane. It was called the Tiger Moth. And I, I can't remember if that was the name of the, the plane itself or if that was a derivation of the Sopwith Camel uh, line of aircraft. But it was very cool. I didn't feel like I had to be a pilot from then on. I would, I would like to learn how to fly to now. But it didn't. I just knew that I liked the sensation. It was a lot of fun. It was very thrilling. But for Amelia... It that was it. Yeah, right? this was it. She was at this point. I think her her future was kind of set in stone. She was she was going to be a pilot come hell or high water. So this really is considered the golden age of aviation. There was a lot of records broken in a very short span of time uh, in the twenties and thirties. Charles Lindbergh had soloed across the Atlantic in the Spirit of St. Louis, his aircraft. In 1927. That's right. He got the Raymond Ortiz Award, which uh, a lot of people don't know this part of this, but he, there was a hotelier in uh, Manhattan who had bought a hotel in Lower Manhattan. I can't remember what its original name was, the Brevoort or something like that. And he renamed it the Lafayette, and it was a it was a hot spot. And I guess he was making enough money that he could offer twenty five thousand dollars to the first person to fly solo from New York to Paris, and Lindbergh got the prize. Yeah, these were big goals back then. No one had done these things when they were accomplished. Big ticker tape parades. People were very excited. Tens of thousands of people would show up to see them being sent off and when they returned. So this was big news of the day. That's right. And there was a publisher named George Putnam, G.P. Putnam, who really cashed in on Lindbergh's success with a book by Lindbergh about his flight which was a huge bestseller, of course. And, you know, in the following year, he was thinking, what, what, you know, what's next? What am I going to do next? I've had so much success with this book. It's just like today when they, you know, they make a movie, it's a hit. They want to make a what's sequel. The next sequel's thing? a hit. Can they we make, make it 3D? Sequel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they're working on all this stuff. And he's like, you know what I need to do? I need, I need to get send a woman across the Atlantic. That was a big novelty of the time because yeah. it was not considered very ladylike. There weren't very many women pilots No, it was all. Yeah, exactly. And Amelia Earhart was one of them who was well known. Wasn't she the 16th woman to get a, a, a pilot's license, I believe? That's though? right. Yeah. She was the 16th woman in history to get a pilot's wow. license from that organization. I can't remember its name, but the, the one that issues the pilot license at the time. Oh, Aeronautique Nationale or something. Uh, yeah. there was a, there's an international the uh, organization. organization. Yeah. So she was the 16th woman to get her license and she wanted to fly the plane, but they were going to, they decided they were going to send her across as a passenger. Right. And, she, I mean, she considered herself baggage, like a sack of potatoes. That's right. She yeah. literally, in quotes, called herself a sack of potatoes on this trip, which I think it belied her irritation at not being a <laughs> pilot. And this was a scary flight. I'll tell you this, the plane on takeoff, the door like fell open and she nearly rolled out the back of the wow. plane. Yeah, so, you know, the, it was a frightening time. And just in the time since Lindbergh had done it, and then when, when she went, 14 people had died trying to duplicate his flight, including three women. Yeah, people were very – well, that's the thing. Back in the day, uh, there was – you know, it was the age of daredevils. People were very hardy, and they didn't have the entertainment that we do now. So when things like this happened, it made big news. Charles Lindbergh was the biggest celebrity in the United States at the time. That's right. Because of this feat, which all unfortunately spawned a kidnapping. Yeah, uh, of, yeah. That's a whole later other on. thing. But, yeah. uh, but no, this was big-time news, and so for a woman to do this – that's Even right. bigger news. That's right. And after this, she ultimately broke a wide series of records. She really was on fire. She became a world-famous celebrity. She was friends with Eleanor Roosevelt. And, and Putnam essentially became her manager. He eventually wound up marrying her, which she uh, reluctantly agreed to. As, as kept a, her very conditional. Name. Yes, very yes. conditional. I think she said that uh, they were just partners only, basically. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At least initially. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, her <laughs> status.
stepchildren had said that they had a, a very loving relationship behind closed doors. But it's a lot of people had differing opinions about it. But he had signed her up to endorse Lucky Strike cigarettes along with 31 other products. Yeah, she had a very gr- – to raise money for this, she had a very grueling publicity schedule. She That's was right. uh, traveling all around. You That's can see right. it in photographs. She she looks bleary-eyed. and uh, Yeah, and you know what the other thing about her that a lot of people don't know is that uh, physically she was kind of frail. She was not always in good health. She had chronic sinusitis. Yeah, she, she had a – you're right, a really bad sinus problem. Yeah, that, sometimes she had a drainage tube. She had to hide with like scarves yeah. and, you know. And, and several op- operations. operations that didn't go very well. Yeah. yeah. Which, in my mind, just makes her a braver, tougher, amazing person. This yeah, she is powered not somebody, through it. Yeah, this is not somebody who's in the lap of luxury up in these planes. I mean, these are these are seriously dangerous flights. I mean, there's flammable liquids everywhere. It's hot as hell inside the plane. There's electrical problems. Airborne radio was in its infancy. Uh, navigation, there just really wasn't any. It's certainly you had not. To look like, out the, yeah, yeah, you're just looking out the, <laughs> out the window. That was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's insane. I mean, and navigation now, especially over water without GPS, is, is an art form. It took a lot of guts to do what she did. And, and in fact, you know, one of her most significant records was the first solo nonstop flight across the Atlantic in a Lockheed Vega in 1932. So four years after she went over as a sack of potatoes, she flew this plane across the Atlantic on her own. She was blown off course. And almost missed it, but wound up well, landing in Ireland. She was heading for London. That's right. right? Yeah. That's right. And it's, it's, now it's five years since Lindbergh did it. And she landed in Ireland, and in no time at all, like 2,000 people showed up. And it, uh, I think the, famously the first guy came up to her and said, have you flown far? And yeah. she said, you know, from America. <laughs> yeah, you're right. One of the, yeah. the farmhands. So you were right. That's the that's the same plane that Wiley Post flew and was the first person to solo around the world. Right. This is a very important fact. Tell us tell us a little bit about Wiley Post. Well, he was a guy who uh, lived a life of great adventure and great uh, jobs. Who was also credited for helping to design the first one of the first pressurized suits. Oh, that's right. For high, he, his thing was really kind of high altitude flying. But he had he also had a Lockheed Vega. It was, it was a, of the day, it was probably the most well-built, powerful plane, very fast for its time. So it was a machine that was capable of this kind of uh, enduring flight. I got to say, that plane, I was not really aware of it until we started this story. And I got to tell you, that is one cool-looking plane. It's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a car nut. <laughs> I, you know, not as a so machine, like, yeah. yeah just, I was just like, that. what is that? It's, it's, a, like, it's a little funky-looking in that uh, there's no windows on the side, I don't believe. It's, it, you, look, you look out through these tiny little windows, and the, the top fixed wings are I – th- I think it's a cantilever design. It's basically they're sandwiched to the fuselage. So it, it it you know giant massive engine out front and it looks kind of it does look funky very 30s with the it's wheel sexy. coverings yeah it's it, but it's it's nicely designed but it yeah. was a very capable machine probably uh, that's why they folks like that flew that but in 1931 was the first man to solo around the world right but now he took now that's the thing he had a shorter distance to go than Amelia because he was at a higher latitude. Than her, so it was a shorter distance. Right, so that's what I was going to say. He took a little bit of the easy way out. He Why? stayed up north. It was well. a shorter trip. <clears throat> By the way, we should point out just really quickly. And yes, I interrupted for us again, but I just we should just quickly point out we are not aviators. We don't know about it. Please don't send us angry emails. We're doing the best we can here. I don't think, but you know what? At this point, I'd I'd welcome some critic. <laughs> it just proves that people are listening. <laughs> but what, what I was going to say is he. Oh, he discovered the jet stream. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, wow. No, I didn't know that. So, you know, but these are, these are not normal people. They're, they're itching for adventure. And so he was the first one to fly around, at a, again, at a higher latitude. I think it was around 15,000, 15,400 miles. What, what do you know? She took a more equatorial line. She, yeah, her she, trip was uh, 27,000, yeah. 27, 29,000 yeah. miles. How did Wiley Post meet his maker? Well, I believe in 1935. Now, he became a good friend of famous humorist from the 20s, Will Rogers. Don't get scared and start turning off your radio. I'm not advertising or trying to sell you anything. If the mouthwash you're using uh, is uh, not the right kind and it tastes sort of like sheep dip, why, you just have to go right on using it. I can't advise any other kind at all. 
he flew Will Rogers to a rodeo. And I think during the, the, you know, the long flight, they got to be friends. And, you know, at the time, Will Rogers is a very famous person. So they were at, I think, Point Barrow, Alaska, which is at the very top of Alaska. You're talking uh, Prudhoe Bay, very cold. Uh, but again, adventurous people do that. So they, uh, unfortunately, as they were taking off, they crashed. I don't know why. But they were both killed. So here you're talking yeah, about two. killed instantly, right? It nosed, uh, nosed you, under or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah so it was yeah. basically, yeah. In the water. Yeah. Didn't didn't make that one. And they were, at the time, two pretty famous people, you know, because he'd already, he'd already circled the globe. And, you know, it's interesting. You talk about these are adventurous people. And you earlier you had said they didn't want to live nine to five lives. That's the same thing with Amelia. She had, one of her biggest fears, apparently, was just was to lead a boring life or to lead not not to leave a mark, basically. Right. All right. So now it's 1937. Amelia's married to G.P. Putnam and she's kind of run out of records to break. And they're actually running a little low on cash, believe it or not. Mm. We need to get another book out there. We need to get something going on. One last big hurrah. Right. Yeah. So he decides that it might be a good idea for her to do a circumnavigation. So in 1937, she announces to the world that she's planning to circumnavigate the globe. So Putnam manages to get Purdue University, where she's visiting faculty, where she consults women about careers. And right. also, I think she was there. She started the uh, the 99s, her organization. Right, the yeah. 99s. Yeah. I think because that was about the number of women in the organization. At the they, time, at the yeah. Time, yeah. yeah. I mean, it quickly ballooned to 116 or something. And now, who knows how many are in it. But they did. They call it the 99s. And then... Uh, but they needed this plane, this Lockheed Electra, which at the time was the most advanced plane on the market. It was, was $80,000. Yeah. Really? Yeah. At the time? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That and, was uh, That's a ton of money. But now Putnam then. managed to swing it. He managed to get Purdue to back the plane. And they were worried that the world was perceiving this as a publicity stunt. So she went and did a whole newsreel or whole appearance about how this is going to be a flying laboratory. Right. And we're going to have all this gear on here. We're going to study long-distance flight and uh, you know atmosphere and all this kind of stuff. It's a real flying laboratory equipped with the latest of instruments. And I hope to accomplish something really worthwhile in aviation scientifically. All of that was BS. <laughs> well, it was they pretty much a publicity stunt. Yeah, yeah, it was basically a publicity stunt. And the, the, there was no gear. There was nothing on the plane but yeah. a ton of fuel tanks. It was heavily loaded. Yeah. Uh, with <laughs> with <but> gas. <laughs> yeah. Well, to, to, to make it, yeah, those great yeah. distances. Yeah. So... Anyway, so they get this trip all set up, and they're, they're actually, originally, they were planning to fly westward. Originally, they were planning to fly westward around the world. Mm-hmm. And so on their first attempt, they were going to leave from... Uh, Oakland? They, yeah, they flew from yeah. Oakland to Hawaii. And her navigator at this time was a man named Captain Harry Manning, who was a very qualified navigator. He was an expert in radio. He had been a sea captain. Right, right. He had a great deal of experience. And it was her and Manning and then her uh, mechanic, Mance, I think he was. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Technical consultant mechanic or whatever. They were – they had flown successfully from Oakland to Hawaii and they were taking off in Hawaii and something went wrong. And they were bouncing down the runway. Now, I just want to point out real quick, Amelia has long suffered from a reputation of not being a great <laughs> pilot. Well, you know what? I I think she uh, she had she definitely had skills. I don't think she was considered an expert pilot of of this for yeah, you so know. She had participated in races where there was one race where she famously came in a distant third and like bounced all the way down the runway on her yeah. landing in front of like they all were the they were uh, the takeoffs and landings were a little rough. Well, you know it's funny like we mentioned the uh, her her first time <laughs> catching air she crashed right, but was not afraid of that. Actually, found it exhilarating. No, she was like Howard Hughes. It's yeah. like I mean. In all the research we've done, I have come to the conclusion that maybe she wasn't the the most skilled in terms of the nuances of flying. Right. But she was fearless. Yeah. She, she was yeah. – or, or completely fearless up until this point because this is what happened in Hawaii. They went to take off. They did not quite get off the ground. And – they crashed and they did what's called a ground loop. Right, right. Uh, or they ground looped, I should say. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you read about – what is a ground loop? Basically what happens is that it's a – aerodynamic phenomenon upon that can happen upon takeoff where one wing will catch some air in kind of an awkward way well of course when that goes up the the other opposing wing 
goes dips down, down and can and can catch the ground. Right. And that what'll happen sort of is that swing around. that'll put you into horizontal. Uh, it'll flip you around. And right. and if it, what's what they say is that once the pilot notices that something like this might be, ha- you have to act immediately to correct it. And if you don't, you can zip, it'll it might even uh, flip you end over end or or do what they call wheelbarrowing. Yeah. And uh, you know, uh, imagine that. But basically, it's not good. And uh, uh, but it it can happen, and it did. And in this case, oh, well, I was going to say, was that a grass uh, field too? Did that? I don't. You know what? Okay. I don't know. All right, yeah. it was not the perfect condition, and also they had a lot of. They were heavy. Yeah, I mean, every time they took off, they were heavy. They had to load, loaded, and loaded, and loaded with fuel because they had so far to go, and the the plane did not want to get airborne most times on on this on this circumnavigation or the plans for the circumnavigation. So. They crashed, essentially, and the, the plane suffered $35,000 in damage. It's nearly half its value. It if it had been a car, yeah. <laughs> the insurance company would have said it was totaled. It totaled. Yeah. yeah. And by some accounts, it was the first time that she experienced real fear. It's, oh, it, really? Yeah. Wow. Where she came, where she was like, okay, you know, I, I could die on this trip. Yeah. And, and so what happened was it was going to take several months to figure out what to do next. Yeah, and re- repair it. Yes, uh, it had to go back to Lockheed and Burbank. It was it was a shipped on a it was carted by ship back. I don't to, know how. Yeah, okay. it certainly wasn't flown. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but it was, but she went back with it, right? Yeah, yeah, they had to, and they're regrouping and they're replanning the trip and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do next. And they, they come to find out through the uh, wind and prevailing weather patterns and all this stuff, they need to reverse the trip. Yeah, they the trade to, winds had changed. Yeah, the trade point, winds right? had changed. Yeah. And then the other thing that happened was Manning, who was the amazing navigator that she had when she was supposed to be taking off from Hawaii was no longer going to be with with the trip <laughs> for and, well there's a lot of different people you know <clears throat> yeah. some people say that he you know he he was a he's still a sea, an active sea captain and the maritime commission had given him a leave of absence for the initial trip and that leave of absence was up so okay. supposedly he just had to go back to work but there are many other people that have suggested that he lost faith in her after that crash well, is I think he wasn't he quoted as saying because that's the thing when she crashed, you, you got to realize people are watching this too, and so there was a journalist who who said that he thought maybe a tire blown out. I think that's what she maybe concluded she had a blowout or so, you know there was a uh, a landing gear um, failure of some kind. I think he was quoted as saying just simply pilot error. Yeah, so he probably maybe lost rethought it, which ultimately was probably a good decision. Yeah, well, in light of what happened, so. Enter the next guy, Fred Noonan, right? Now, Fred... I'm sorry, no. Was Fred on the flight from Oakland to Hawaii initially? He was not on the flight, but he was part of the team. Okay. So, you know, she already had the team. So he was kind of the... He was the next guy. Yes. You know, because you have your... You have your... All your people lined up in case something happens. And so Fred Noonan was going to now be the guy that was going to go with her now that they've reversed course. And they're going to start this time in Hawaii and head to Oakland. That was going to be the first round. And... The thing about Man- Manning and Fred knew each other because they were there at the same time. Noonan was considered one of the best celestial navigators right. in the world. But Can you explain that a little bit? He was able to navigate by the stars okay. with a sextant. He was also had a lot of maritime experience. He was not a captain, but he was a merchant marine. Right. And he had moved up through several years to high ranks in the merchant marines and actually all the way to the rank of officer. Oh, yeah. So he was a very good navigator and was considered to be one of the best. And it's the guy that can look out a window and tell you and yeah. get fixes. The other thing he was an expert at is dead reckoning, which is an amazing skill. What And, and yeah, please explain that. Well, dead reckoning is a skill where all you need is one fix. You have this one fix. You know mm-hmm. this one place. Then you have a map and a good clock and you can keep track of where you're going just based on that right. last position by speed and direction by speed and time and, elapsed yeah and time okay. elapsed and uh in fact there's that famous quote in hunt for red october give me a stopwatch and a map and i'll fly the alps in a plane with no windows in dead reckoning it's absolutely essential that you have good time pieces and that you and everyone associated with your mission is using the same base of time yeah that was a, that right? turned out to be a problem let's later. not get ahead of ourselves okay. but anyway so the other thing about noonan and i wouldn't say this if it wasn't mentioned in numerous places right bit of a drinker yeah uh just that was known it yeah was known. it was known and in in fact he had been uh, a navigator for pan am for several years and flew the china clipper famous which was a very famous uh plane yeah think of uh, indiana Anna Jones and the that yeah famous exactly scene. it's yeah. a it's a flying boat. He supposedly resigned from Pan Am because he felt like he had gone as far as he could go as a navigator, and he wanted to start a navigation school mm-hmm. and move on with his life. Although, not a lot of people resign 
I, I don't know. There, there, there was implications that there was an incident or that something There's was around his drinking yeah. and that Pan Am maybe asked him to resign. Right. <laughs> well, it's like, but I don't want to cast aspersions on his character. He was no. an ama- This guy was an amazing man and he was an amazing navigator and he was a very skilled individual. Yeah. But now that Manning has left after the crash in Hawaii, Amelia is now going up with Fred, who is a different sort of character and also is – from what I understand, more gruff and sure. that sort of thing. And, and Manning was critical of, of Noonan saying that he was not a constant navigator. He basically yeah. was like, he doesn't pay enough attention. He's not checking in on his route right. enough. So that's just something to think about as, as time goes on. The, the other thing to remember is that the preparation for this trip had taken forever, especially after the crash. There was another like three months of repositioning. Right. And Putnam was pushing her really hard. And, you know, there's are, there's differing points of view about whether or not it was too much for her. She kind of was over all this. She was. She had already said she just wanted this yeah. to be kind of her last. Well, she big was. That's, flight. We talked about this earlier or mentioned this. She was exhausted. Yeah. She she was still doing these promotional tours. Right. And still having physical issues. By yeah. the way. And you know this comes back to that whole thing. Was her marriage with George Putnam was that a business? Was it love? Was it both? People say different things. You know. And then, and when you get down the road on the theories as to what happened to them, did he put this trip together or did the U.S. government ask them to take this trip? And that's something we'll come back well, to that, later. Yeah, yeah. And remember, she was friends with FDR and Eleanor. So, right. Getting back to who was president at the time. That's dumb. Everybody knows that. If I say FDR, they no, you know what? Kids nowadays don't know that. <laughs> it's sad to say. <laughs> no don't one say kids nowadays. I mean, we are making us sound like we're seventy-five years old. Anyway, so they had they flew all the way around the world, and they had gone most of the way. They only had like two more stops when yeah. they when they got to New Guinea. Well, she had been through yeah. monsoons in Singapore that were so bad the paint. The, what little paint there was yeah. on that plane had come off the plane. Right. And uh, she was still suffering from chronic sinusitis. She had, uh, by the time they got to New Guinea, which was their last departure. Yeah, I think quickly, though, uh, it was Miami, then South America, and right. then over to Africa. Yeah. Then uh, uh, middle, uh, middle. Then Africa, then, uh, yeah, Mi- Miami, South America, then um, into Dakar, right. and then to uh, Mali. Yes. In Indonesia, then they went through the Middle East, then they went to Saudi Arabia, yeah. came down through Thailand, Singapore, that's where the monsoons were that right. they flew through, and then to Australia, and then from Australia to New Guinea. Right, Papua New Guinea. And this was going to be, though, as far as that sounds, the most treacherous leg of the yeah, journey. Yeah, the longest and most treacherous leg was from Papua New Guinea to Howland Island, yeah. where she was supposed to go. And they get to Papua New Guinea. They've been flying for 40 days, sleeping five hours a night. Ugh. And along with the monsoons and all the other things and the heat and the whatever else is happening inside that airplane that's filled with gasoline, she's she's there's a little bathroom in the back. In the very back, there's a little cabin. Well, I would so hope so. Imagine what this bathroom is like. She's uh, she's throwing up. She's yeah. got diarrhea. She's and she, the chronic sinusitis is giving her problems. Can you imagine this having sinusitis and flying? And flying. To, yeah. yeah, I mean that's an issue now. Right. So again, she's kind of she's really the, kind of the ultimate badass. Yeah. I mean, well, she's, she's putting up with all this stuff. Yeah. Tremendous will and drive. You know. Yeah. Pushing so, her along, and especially after this crash, you know, to come back and hey, you know what? We're still going to do this. Yeah. So now we get to the point where they're in Papua New Guinea, and it's time to go on their last leg to Howland Island. Oh, and oh, by the way, in Miami, 17 stops before New Guinea for weight, she ditched the life raft, her parachute, and I don't know why, a good luck charm. Some elephant hair bracelet that she had that was a good luck charm. Well, that might have come in handy. Yeah, got rid of all those, and that was way back, like on the fifth stop. You know? it, well, she did it to get, yeah, so she could have more weight for fuel, or right. at more fuel as weight, I guess. Right, because it's like we were talking about with yeah. Alex, you know, every little thing comes yeah. into play when you're trying to cover... Yeah, it's like backpacking. Distance. People are, you know, they're drilling holes in their tooth brush. I don't yes. know how much that's going to save you. But the the idea, though, is that everything that was... And, and oh, also, I think she had some newfangled radio telecommunication equipment. That's right, that she that didn't she want. That she clipped out. Yeah, there, yeah. Was a, there was like a, a, a kind of a new antenna, uh, an expanding loop antenna right. that uh, was pretty effective, but the, the, it was a pain in the butt to have to reel back in. Yes, so I think they ended, it in and out. they ended up just clipping that. Yeah. And the, the, these are all kind of fateful... Yeah, Probably faithful choice. Dis- well, this is what the, this is what's called an error chain, which is a known philosophy, which is where like a series of errors lead up to a disaster. It's never just one thing. Yeah, you know, there's another thing called the Swiss cheese theory, which right. sort of suggests that like you have these barriers to problems that are like pieces of Swiss cheese, and 
um, it is possible for those pieces of Swiss cheese to get lined up in such a way that you could pass through them all without hitting anything. And that moment is the moment at which a disaster occurs. Right. So they they were making a lot of choices here between the life raft and the radio. And they, they, she had also ditched her Morse code equipment. Which proved to be a fateful error. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how much it would matter because apparently they didn't know Morse code. They, well, they didn't know Morse code, but didn't the original plan that was devised not ma- yeah. uh, well, by yes. Manning yes. was that, to communicate? Are we very, getting ahead of ourselves? Because a, a little this bit. is a thing. He was devising the radio communication plan with the Coast Guard. Yes. What Forrest is talking about here is that the original uh, navigator, Manning, who bailed after the ground loop in Hawaii on the first attempt, the failed first attempt, he had put in a radio plan that included Morse code, which he was quite familiar with as a sea captain. But like 90% Morse code. Exactly. And the problem is when they rearranged everything and replanned the flight, which, by the way, poor planning was a theme for this flight – when Noonan moved into the navigation position, they failed to change from Manning's radio plan for the trip to a plan devised by Noonan. Right. Or even deciding that voice communication was going to be primarily used. That's right. So it's another step in the error yeah. chain. So now we get to the point where it's time for them to take off from New Guinea. Now, I've done a lot of research on this, a lot. And yes, I, you have. <laughs> <laughs> there's some facts that I found that I couldn't find again, but I did read somewhere. Yeah. That the night before they took off in New Guinea, they had argued about something. Or, I, that was, I think that was fairly well documented. Yeah, they had a fight uh, about something. I mean, you know, at this point, whatever. She's throwing up. She's pooing. She's, oh, you know, hasn't just, slept you, in forever. You can imagine being – you're in a tin box or an aluminum yeah. skin box with somebody for days Yeah, it's like real, on real world Electra 10E, yeah. you know. So then, like, they had an argument, and supposedly that culminated with Noonan going off to a bar. Yeah. And, he, well, he, there was reports. That, well, the bartender, they, like, he yeah. poured him like several okay, tall so scotches. Okay, so you read this too somewhere. I did see it. I'll take another. So this is obviously yeah. not ideal for your takeoff the next day. No, but they didn't take off the next day. Oh, they didn't? I d- di- now, this is from the doc- a documentary I saw on this. Oh, okay. Uh, due to weather, because I thought like, oh my, you know. No, this what's, is something I didn't know. Well, I where, what's, well oh, you mean uh, after the fight? Yes. Well, then uh, the very next morning, uh, yeah. because I think due to what they call, you know, uh, mechanical problems, right. which I'm going to call With... hangover. <laughs> hangover. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. See, now well, I Well, and, and, some, and some sketchy weather. Uh, okay. I think it was maybe a day or so later. Okay. But it was, they didn't wait too long. Right, I mean, right, it right. was like the, maybe either the next day or the day after that. Right. But, it, but, but look, this is, uh, you know, if you're not working someone's last nerve, as they say, by this time, it's quite remarkable because, yeah, I'm sure they had differences of opinion on, on different things. They end up having this argument. He storms off. It's so already like it's the storm clouds are brewing and, and for real ones, too, because I guess the weather was starting to get bad around this area. That's right. And it, you know what? They needed to get going. And so anyway, they load the plane up in an effort to keep the explicit tag off our show. I'm just going to say a metric ton <laughs> of fuel. Yeah. And it's heavy. It's ready to go. They're trying to go to Howland Island. And we're going to get into this, but Howland Island is like a piece of spaghetti in the middle of it's, the Pacific It's a, uh, it, you <laughs> know what? It looks like to me like a, a cucumber shaped an flat piece of <laughs> land with no, yeah. it's, uh, I think at the time it had more vegetation on it, but it's very tiny. Right. And it's not very hospitable. There's nothing on it. But, but it was a, it's a, it's a halfway point. That's right. Uh, it's a perfect halfway yeah. point between Hawaii and New Guinea. Right. And so that's, that's the goal. That's the destiny. They plan this trip around the world, poorly planned this trip around the yeah. world. <laughs> and, and Howland Island is where they're headed to. So they load that plane up with fuel. They get ready to take off. As there and there is footage of this, you can find it on our website yeah. actually. Yes, there of them right. going down the runway, and if you look closely, you will see the belly is like bouncing down because there's yeah. so much gas, and it stripped uh, an antenna off the belly. Reportedly, of the yeah, right? they, people uh, thought they saw that. I don't think they found anything. No, afterwards. but they they did not find it in the field. But I'm yeah. not convinced they actually looked. But just right. there was no debris reported right. after the takeoff. But who knows if anyone even went over to the airstrip. Yeah. But uh, also, it just didn't want to go up. It, yeah. So they, were t- they took off, and they got to the end of the runway, and people were literally holding their breath because it seemed like it was not going to get airborne. 
she's going to she's going to hit water here. Exactly. Soon. So she's like trying to lift it up and she rotates and it comes up a little but it is now flying on just ground effect ground air, effect which air. is a, a phenomenon where the the pocket of air on the earth is just barely supporting the plane yeah. off the ground. And so it went out over the water at a very low altitude for a very long time, and finally she was able to get it to rotate, and it sailed up into the history books. Yeah, I told you this was going to be a two-parter. I know. I really thought we could get this done in one show. <laughs> Why did you think that? There, I don't know. There's a lot of... We no, haven't even... Okay. There are so many cans of worms here yeah, that this, we didn't realize we would hit, but they're, but they're interesting. We thought this was going to be an easy show. We thought it was going to all be no, about I the never piece thought of metal. That. I told you at the beginning. I never thought... <laughs> Because you're dealing with some, one, it's historical and controversial in that no one really knows, but there's several prevailing theories. Yeah, but everyone yeah. who is involved with each one of the theories yeah. thinks they know. They think the theory, everyone is just like, the mystery is solved. Well, and by the way, every time they do a press release, every media outlet on the planet is like, the plane has been found. The mystery is solved. It's like, you know what? It's not. <laughs> That's an effect, though of human behavior, which I find fascinating, because it's not about the facts. It's not about, look, there's people who, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but there's people who saw things. That's right. Not just one, but hundreds of people. And then there's people who didn't see any of that, but they think that they found some evidence, uh, physical evidence. So there's a difference right. between, look. The, and then there's other people crunching numbers in supercomputers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot going on. So this is the long and short of it. We wanted to do this all in one show, but we made an agreement when we started this show not to ever have any single episode be too much more than an hour long. And there is no way for us to cover all the ways that Amelia Earhart supposedly disappeared. To and, do it justice, I and think. And to do it justice yeah. in the next five or ten minutes. Yeah, we thought we could wrap this up in maybe an hour, and the more we dove into this, we realized there's several prevailing theories that each one has its own merits. And to do them justice, we're really going to have to come back. <laughs> We'll see you back in two weeks with our conclusion on what happened to Amelia Earhart. I want to thank Judson Crane for our amazing theme music, Ryan McCullough for world-class sound design, and Jim Creative Design. But most importantly, we want to thank our listeners. You can find us online at astonishinglegends.com, on Facebook at the Astonishing Legends Podcast, and also on Twitter. Copyright Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Good night. Good night.